Well, thank you for joining us today. My name is David Auschelow. I'm an experimental physicist working in quantum information science and engineering at Argonne National Laboratory, serving as the director of QNEXT, one of the new DOE quantum information science research centers, and the Lou Family Professor of Quantum Engineering and Physics here at the University of Chicago. I also manage the Argonne Quantum Loop Project, focused on quantum communication near Chicago, and therefore I'm particularly excited to be moderating today's panel on quantum networking. Now, this panel brings together an incredible group of scientists and engineers from national labs, industry, and academia. It includes Duncan Earl, the president and CTO of Cubitech Corporation, Aidan Figueroa, professor of physics at Stony Brook and a scientist at Brookhaven National Laboratory, Kathy Ann Soderberg, the principal research physicist at the Air Force Research Laboratory in Rome, New York, Maria Spiropoulou, professor of physics at Caltech, and Raymond Newell, a research scientist and the quantum communication team leader at Los Alamos National Lab. Now, in contrast to quantum computing and quantum sensing, this panel is gonna focus on quantum networks and communication, a rapidly moving area of quantum technology with really impressive efforts, both within the country and around the world. It's also an area that requires quite strong and very deep collaboration between national labs, companies both large and small, and universities throughout the United States. Now, our community needs to assemble an unusually broad group of scientists and engineers that span physics, electrical engineering, computer science, and materials research, among others. Because at the end of the day, successful quantum networks and communication systems will require unprecedented control of single quanta at the level of individual electrons, nuclei, and photons with robust protocols. And in fact, all operating outside of our normal controlled laboratory environments, that is in the real world. It means creating strong encryption protocols, error correction schemes, very efficient sources and detectors, among other things. It's an exciting time for the area. Now today in this panel, we'll discuss recent developments in the field, especially focusing on the technical challenges that lay before us. What are the driving areas of interest? Who will the first users be of this nascent technology, including accessing the new communication test bed at various national labs around the country? And to that point, what near and long-term application to the focus of industry? And when we think about building this community, how will universities and national laboratories align and collaborate with the private sector while avoiding competition, dealing with IP? And with a quantum net, perhaps most important, what are the potential impacts on society? So I'd like to begin by having each member of the panel introduce themselves and their connection to this topic in alphabetical order, starting with Duncan Earl. Duncan? Thanks, David. Um, so my name is Duncan Earl, and, and maybe just in terms of introduction, I'll tell you three things about myself for people that don't know me. I'm uh, the president and the CTO of Cubitech. That's a small company in San Diego, California that I founded about seven years ago. And as it relates to the communications and quantum networking field, we make, really we're a component maker. We make devices like, like this. This is one of our entangled photon sources devices. Uh, we also make uh, single photon counting detectors and uh, high-speed electronics, all of the components and devices that quantum researchers really need in developing their own communication or networking systems. We also make quantum key distribution systems, which we're targeting at uh, secure, for securing electrical utilities, which we think is a, a good first market for those kind of quantum systems. Uh, second, I'm an 18-year veteran of Oak Ridge National Laboratories, so I spent 18 years working at Oak Ridge and got to see, for better or worse, the, the good and the bad of developing technology within a national lab. And one of the things I learned is that you can develop technology really only so far in, in a national lab, right? There's, there's a role the national lab plays, and then you get to a certain point and there's a technology transfer where you, you hand it off to, to, to industry or some other uh, partner. Uh, and then third, I think as, as well as some others on the panel, I've actually been a, an entrepreneur that has spun out a technology, has licensed technology from the national lab, and then tried to take it the next, you know, the next step, going through that valley of death, finding investors to move the technology along. So I, I've played a couple of different roles as a, a technology developer, and I look forward to using that experience in our, our conversation today. Thanks, Duncan. Aiden? 
Hi, everybody, and uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel. Um, you know, these are colleagues that I have in the last two years had the opportunity to talk to extensively. There are a lot of opportunities uh, in, in, in the coming future, and it's, it's really bright. Um, you know, a little bit of my background. I'm, um, I'm an associate professor in the physics and astronomy department in Stony Brook University. And in my lab here in Stony Brook, we are developing um, quantum technology uh, that is targeted to build quantum communication networks. Um, something in our philosophy that is very particular is that we are trying to operate many of these systems at, at room temperature. That I think is something unique to what we do. And you know, little by little, we'll be making progress in demonstrating that this is actually a, um, a viable pathway. Um, I, I have many hats. And the second hat that I wear is I'm also um, a founding member of a, of a startup company that is called Cunect. Right, so Cunect is a company that has licensed many of the things that we have produced in the lab in Stony Brook, and right now is trying to commercialize uh, first room temperature quantum memories uh, for a variety of applications. And in the last two years, I also got the opportunity to become a joint appointment in Brookhaven National Labs, and this has opened um, a great possibilities to really expand uh, the networking that we do here on Long Island to going from you know small experiments that we can do in an academic laboratory into now doing some really formal experiments connecting campuses across uh, several tens of kilometers. And, and this is where we are. And uh, hopefully I can tell you more about it uh, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Aiden. And Kathy Ann? Hi, yes, thank you. I'm happy to be here today. Thank you for the invitation. So as you heard, my name's Kathy Ann Soderberg and I'm a principal research physicist at the Air Force Research Lab in Rome, New York. I'm the lead for the trapped ion quantum networking effort, and I'm also the program manager for our in-house internal quantum networking program. I've been at AFRL for about six years. Before that, I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan. I did my postdoc at the University of Chicago, uh, all in cold atom and trapped ion physics, both of those. And then I was a technical consultant for a few years before I joined the Air Force Research Lab. So just to give you a little bit of background, not as many people are familiar with the Air Force Research Lab. So we're the primary scientific and re research and development center for the Air Force. Our role is to develop innovative technology solutions to help the warfighter. We have nine locations across the US and three international sites. Our quantum work is spread across six of those directorates, directorates and covers all areas of timing, sensing, networking, and computing. As I said before, I'm the program manager for our work in Rome, and that covers quantum networking and quantum computing. And for our networking work, our, our goal is to make a heterogeneous quantum network that has trapped ions, superconducting qubits, and photonic integrated circuits. Uh, we also have an algorithm group that will inform some of that hardware, those hardware efforts uh, once that's, the technology is a bit more advanced. And so, um, yeah, I hope to talk more about that soon. Thank you. Thanks very much, and Maria. Yes, so thank you for having me here today. I am Maria Spiropoulou. I'm a professor of physics at Caltech, and I have been working on big science, high energy physics collider projects for about uh, 25 years at Fermilab in Illinois and CERN at the LHC. In the past five years, I have been also working on the intersections of high energy physics with quantum science and technology research areas, including quantum networking, which is the topic of this panel. Since 2017, Caltech has led a multidisciplinary, multi-institutional, collaborative, public-private research program that we call Intelligent intelligent quantum networks and technologies are INCUNET in short, that we founded with AT&T as well as Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We designed, built, commissioned and deployed two quantum teleportation systems towards a practical quantum internet, one at Fermilab, the Fermilab Quantum Network, FQNET, and one at Caltech's Lauritan Laboratory for High Energy Physics, the Caltech Quantum Network or CQNET. Both of these systems are accessible to quantum researchers for R&D purposes, as well as testing and integration of various novel devices, such as, for example, transducers, on-chip integrated nanophotonic devices, and quantum memories that eventually will be needed to upgrade such systems towards a realistic quantum internet. 
Our systems are being used for improvements of the entanglement quality and the implementation of protocols with complex entangled states towards more advanced quantum communication channels, as well as investigations of uh, fundamental physics, the quantum nature of space time. So the systems serve both fundamental quantum information science as well as quantum technologies. Our latest results from our quantum internet prototype systems, they feature state-of-the-art teleportation fidelity in time being qubits, record uptime and operation, uh, first in theoretical modeling that includes imperfections of the realistic setup in comparison with the data, and overall first in systems integration of such prototypes with automated monitoring, data acquisition, real-time and real-time data analysis systems. And you see one of, our, um, one of our systems just right behind me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. And Raymond. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. I appreciate the opportunity to, to share some of the work that uh, my group, my team, and the broader uh, collaborative effort here at Los Alamos uh, has directed toward quantum information science, and in particular, quantum networking. Uh, Los Alamos uh, researchers have been working on developing uh, initially point-to-point -point links and then subsequent efforts in uh, quantum networking for, gosh, more than 20 some odd years now. Uh, and we can, uh, we can identify several important breakthroughs and highlights in the field that we've been able to accomplish in that time. Um, some of the earliest uh, first theoretical and then later proof of principle work in satellite to ground commun quantum communication uh, was conducted here at Los Alamos. That effort continues. In our work in quantum mechanics, we've developed uh, uh, significant new uh, thrusts in quantum networking for critical infrastructure protection. Of course, the Los Alamos National Laboratory has a mission focus in national security science and uh, using the latest uh, breakthroughs in uh, both fundamental and applied scientific techniques to improve uh, both national security of the United States as well as global stability and security as well. Uh, so uh, to that end, uh, we've been working very hard to develop uh, networks of quantum information processing that uh, extend the security benefits of point-to-point -point links to network and long-range applications, uh, both in optical fiber and in free space optical comms. Uh, we also have uh, significant enduring efforts in quantum algorithm development. Uh, both for optimization problems in uh, quantum computers, should those exist. Uh, we at Los Alamos have one of the D-Wave machines, uh, which is, of course, not a uh, fully operational general purpose quantum computer, uh, but it is very effective as a quantum annealing device. Uh, and that's, a, uh, that's installed just down the hall for me, as a matter of fact, uh, and it's a subject of uh, continuing ongoing research to understand its capabilities uh, and its boundaries so that we can understand uh, the state of the art and how that may grow in the future. Uh, and then finally, I'd highlight uh, a, a significant and growing body of work in quantum materials taking place here. Uh, all networks will, of course, be enabled by um, and bounded by the abilities of specific devices which are able to be created. Uh, and here at Los Alamos, we have an ongoing uh, series of efforts uh, in uh, establishing long range coherence uh, and in transduction. Uh, using materials which exploit the unusual properties of uh, weakly correlated five electron systems, um, which are really very interesting systems because they sort of span the boundary. Uh, inside a single atom, you can span the, the classical quantum boundary. Um, and there, there's very good, interesting research taking place there. Of course, a much more fundamental nature than the, the communication systems and the networking systems that I think will be the focus of our talk today. But hopefully the sort of thing that would give us opportunities for future growth and to really advance the boundaries going forward. So again, thank you for the opportunity to join the panel today. Raymond, thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you for, uh, for your great introductions. So now let's go ahead and get uh, engaged right into the panel topics. And I'd like to go ahead and ask each of you a question uh, again, in alphabetical order, starting with Duncan. So Duncan, from the perspective of a company, what do you think are the major technological challenges in the field of quantum networking and communication? Well, there's definitely a, a lot of challenges, um, at least for, for a company, a small business specifically, what I can tell you we're focused on and, and what we think is really needed in the community really relates more to um, the devices and the availability of the tools. So if you think back to like the first generation um, you know, computers, first digital computers, they were all using uh, vacuum tubes, uh, 20,000 vacuum tubes, right, in the first uh, uh, digital computer. So 
uh, somebody had to figure out how to blow the glass and you know get all that working and then there were companies that got really really good at making vacuum tubes obviously their their uh, uh their their days were numbered because <laughs> transistors were coming but you had to start somewhere and i would say with quantum technology we're kind of at the vacuum tube stage and so uh developing those basic components, the, uh, the, the sources, the qubit generators, the memory systems, the, uh, just the basic detectors for uh, single photon detection, developing those in a way where they're um, rugged, they're consistent. Um, cost is an issue, obviously, but probably not the biggest one. Right now, it's just a matter of building these devices so that everyone can use them, that they're reliable and they're consistent. And that is not trivial. There's a lot of uh, hard work that's going to have to go into doing that. Uh, right now at, at Cubitech, we make uh, these entangled photon sources, and we're happy if we make 100 in a year. But we need to be making 100,000 to really get that kind of consistency down. So in terms of technical challenges for, for companies, we really see the development of a market where we can sell these products into that market, and they're being used routinely by the community, and they fit the needs of the community as one of the big challenges. Duncan, thank you very, thank you very much. And Aiden, let me go next to you. You've recently launched a fiber-based quantum communication system in Long Island using atomic-based systems at from temperatures you just mentioned. What do you think is the next step to push your test bed forward? Yeah, thank you, David. Yeah, so what we're working really hard in the last, um, in the last weeks and is been to demonstrate that these atomic systems are capable of, of operating at telecom frequencies, which is important to then do long distance communication. And, you know, we have uh, been successful recently in um, communicating qubits in, in one of these uh, cryptographic uh, setups between Stony Brook and BNL, right, already over uh, this distance of about 140 kilometers. And those were quantum memory compatible qubits. So then our next step was to demonstrate that the memory can actually receive and emit photons at telecom. And I'm actually very happy to tell you, like just yesterday, we did a measurement in which for a first time, we have demonstrated that this is possible, right? We grab photons from an entangled source that my students have been building for some time, and then we pass it through a memory, right? And then with all these uh, lasers, we were able to transfer this entanglement from the photon at rubidium wavelengths into telecom, and, and it already reached BNL, right? And to, for us, this is exactly what we needed to demonstrate that these systems now can then be brought into different places to start building longer and longer networks. So then uh, the next steps that we, that we want to have in this, in, in this collaboration is basically, the first thing will be to show the entanglement between two quantum memory systems that are separated by 140 kilometers. I think now this becomes possible now that we know that the photons can be emit and receive from the memories. And then we want to expand the network, right? Currently we are in the process of expanding our network going from Stony Brook to BNL. Uh, in a couple of months, it's gonna reach um, Garden City on Long Island. And we're expecting that in, in the in middle of the spring, it's gonna reach also New York City. And then because now we have these uh, deployable devices, we're gonna, have, gonna be able to start testing the propagation of entanglement in really long distance uh, considerations. And most importantly, we believe that 2021 is going to be the year that perhaps, hopefully, uh, we might be able to demonstrate um, quantum memory advantage in a real long distance system. So this is really what you know, my 10 students are working towards. And that's really exactly what we need to demonstrate before we can make the claim that we can build long distance quantum networks. So, I mean, the future is bright, but there's still a lot of work to do to really do the demonstrations that will then allow make claims about building a real quantum internet. Thank you, Aiden. Thank you very much. And Kathy Ann, so let me turn to you. How important will quantum networking test beds be in advancing our understanding of entanglement distribution? And you know, in that sense, what are the Air Force Research Lab's plans to help develop this area? Sure, yeah. I think that the networking test beds are going to be critically important to the field as a whole, in much the same way that accessing quantum computers has helped push the whole field forward with IBM having its device online now. And so I think the test beds will play a similar role to help distribute entanglement and learn how to validate entanglement. And so I think another critical piece of the test bed is gonna be component development, both the classical and the quantum components. It'll give people a, a venue to, to test these out before we try and put them in real world applications. 
Um, and so towards this, AFRL is setting up a distributed quantum networking testbed. And so by distributed, I mean it's distributed across three geographic sites at, at AFRL, and it's also distributed across research areas. So it starts in a very basic research area and goes to applied research because eventually the Air Force has to has to put these systems wherever the warfighter is going to be. So we really need to develop the system to work well and be turnkey uh, and have a low size, weight, and power so that it can be deployed. And so uh, the, the test bed, the first leg of the test bed is going to be in our recently opened and recently announced Innovari Advancement Center, which is an, a, a new facility to help us better collaborate with both our domestic and international partners. And so this will be um, a heterogeneous quantum network that will have trapped ions, superconducting qubits, and the quantum photonic integrated circuits. And the work will be on very basic research to do the preliminary connections and protocols needed for, for the test bed. And then the next component will be in our in-house research facility. So now this is a little bit more of a closed system, if you will. And the focus there will be to further apply the research and reduce the size, weight, and power of the systems to get them ready to go out into field sites. And so the final leg of the test bed is the field sites <clears throat> where we'll be able to test both ground to ground and ground to air applications. And we're pushing toward a demo to get an integrated quantum integrated photonic circuit on an unmanned aerial system and connect it down to a trapped ion station on the ground. And so all three legs of the test bed will have all three research components for our in-house work, the ions, superconducting qubits and integrated photonic circuits. It'll also host our quantum algorithm work, which is more in computing, but I think will help inform the network coding later on. Uh, that's primarily with our IBM hub that we have at AFRL right now. And then really the main idea for each component is that each leg of the test bed will seed development into the next. So the basic research will seed the applied, which will seed the test sites. And then inevitably you'll learn something that you can't do in the field. So you need to go right back to the basic research leg. And so, you know, we're, we're excited to get that started. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot. And Maria, so you've recently written an editorial for the American Physical Society newsletter on the structures and the frameworks that are necessary to implement a quantum internet. Could you talk uh, briefly about the main challenges and the proposed directions that you've identified? Yes, thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, indeed, since uh, the introduction of the quantum science and technology program at Fermi, 2017, I and uh, Christoph Simon, who is an actual quantum science and technology researcher in Canada, have been brainstorming, debating, arguing, and discussing also with our peers, both in HEP and quantum science areas, what are the challenges of merging constructively multidisciplinary science and engineering communities and cultures. Uh, after participating at the DOE's Quantum Internet Blueprint Workshop earlier this year and interacting with uh, all of you and other leading scientists from DOE's national labs and universities, it became clear that the DOE and other agencies' researchers were fully driven to identify the opportunities and challenges we need to address in order to execute strategically and methodically a plan for construction of the quantum internet prototype that will connect national labs as well as other hubs in academia and the private sector. Specifically, the Blueprint Report discusses science applications in the mission of the DOE and in code design spirit, using networks of sensors, quantum processing devices, computer secure communications, using uh, quantum networks and communication protocols. In addition, this hybrid over the air and fiber based systems with various edge devices are being explored as near term systems for long distance quantum communication and entanglement distribution. Now, the opportunity the quantum connectivity presents has been studied a lot theoretically and some experimentally since many years. A network of quantum nodes that is linked by classical channels has access to an exponentially smaller state space compared to a full quantum network. So quantum networking of quantum devices is the ultimate target. And across various domains, researchers are studying applications on fundamental physics, nature of space-time, quantum imaging for medical purposes, 
with quantum magnetometer networks and so on. The challenge we identified in this editorial is building the organizational framework and cultural foundation so that people from multiple domains in science and technology can collaborate as seamlessly as possible. We use some examples from the established big science culture of high energy physics where I come from and astronomy that call us to deliver projects and results thought of as impossible. Now building a quantum internet we think we require some similar approach and culture and we suggest in the article that to address fundamental science question and deliver systems that have the potential to change society at large some version of this big science model is needed that requires government investment national laboratory capacities and academic and industry partners oh, thank you very much uh, and uh, Raymond, last uh, but uh, not least, as a scientist at Los Alamos, what impact do you think a quantum internet could have on national security? That's a great question, thank you. Uh, we pursue this work because we think it would have a very large and very positive impact on national security and global security, global stability worldwide. Uh, we've all, uh, I think, uh, heard about the, the enormous potential that quantum computing uh, may bring in its ability to uh, solve uh, certain types of computation problems currently considered utterly intractable and likely to remain utterly intractable through classical computational methods for, you know, for our lifetimes and possibly the lifetime of the universe. There are a number of incredibly valuable, incredibly worthwhile uh, uh, challenges which could be met uh, if we had uh, you know, universal quantum computers that were available. And just as classical computers value is increased enormously by connecting them by a network we also expect network of quantum computers would also have uh would really be required to uh, unlock their full potential right in classical computing this is uh, metcalf's law the value of any computational resource goes as the square or the number of nodes uh, connected in that resource uh, and we would expect something like that and perhaps even more so uh, in quantum computing so um, you know, in the national security space, as, as in many other spaces, such as, say, uh, farm drug discovery in the pharma pharmaceutical world, uh, you know, in, in reducing carbon footprint by increasing uh, energy efficiency. Um, there are many, many problems that ultimately boil down to optimization problems for which we think that quantum computing and, in fact, a network of quantum computers may be uh, much more valuable and much, uh, much better able to uh, to reach relevant solutions and relevant timescales. Uh, and to that end, uh, we've been working very hard both to develop those algorithms, uh, the machines on which those algorithms could run, uh, and the devices to add to those networks. So um, I, I really do feel that quantum networking, um, while it would have specific and direct benefits to the United States, um, I, I completely agree uh, with Maria's comments that it, it really does require uh, a, a international collaboration, uh, and that that collaboration, I think, is, is very justified by the fact that it would, it would uh, well, raise all boats, for, for lack of a better mind word, that, that I think we could all uh, enjoy significant benefits, um, both in national security uh, and in, the, in many other interesting and relevant problems that benefit all of society um, with a quantum network. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Those are all fantastic uh, answers to tough questions. But uh, just to make things a little more complicated for you, I'd like to ask all of you one question and a prediction. And to do all of this in just a couple of minutes. And we'll go in the same order, but let me just uh, give you the question, which is, what do you see as a critical obstacle to launching a national quantum internet? And how can the DOE play a role in overcoming this challenge? So that's my question. But to this end, let me ask you, when do you think we might imagine a practical quantum internet operating within metropolitan areas and then nationally. So why don't we go ahead and start in our alphabetical order with Duncan. So I'm probably going to be the outlier in my, uh, <laughs> my uh, explanation or, or answer. But uh, first off, I just want to say I really like what Maria said about access. I think access is really critical for the community, right? And you're talking about really complicated, expensive equipment that most colleges and, and you know, researchers and, and companies just don't have access to right now. So we've got to find a way to, to provide that access. And I do think a quantum network, that's got to be one of the things that's key about it. But right now, I think the, the sort of the major obstacle is one of 
uh, vision. And this is, where I, this is where I may be the outlier. Most, most people, when they think about a quantum network as something where I put a qubit in and it comes out somewhere else, you know, for, at a partner's site or something, it, it's a passive device. It just conducts this uh, or transmits these qubits around, which definitely it does. I don't want to uh, uh, make it sound like it doesn't, but it sounds very, very passive the way people describe it today. And that's going to shape the partners we get involved and how we try and sort of roll this out across the country. I, I actually think that's maybe the wrong way to think about a quantum network. I think of it much more actively, almost like the electrical grid where you have a big, you know, hydroelectric, you know, dam that's cranking out these electrons for everybody to use. And there's substations that are switching and moving them around. I, I think that really to be valuable, that we need those common resources on that quantum network. It needs to be a resource that everybody can access. They should be able to dial up exactly what they need. If they need, you know, 10,000 ancilla photons at a certain wavelength, they should be able to get that from a quantum network. And that kind of a uh, thinking or vision about a quantum network is very different. You know, it's almost like utilities would pop up that would offer these, these services or quantum service providers. And I think until we're all on the same page for how passive or how, how active this quantum network is going to be until that vision is there, uh, that will be a challenge for the DOE in terms of rolling out something that really can scale. So Duncan, thank you. I, I just want to add, I think uh, from my view, that sort of has to be true because when you think about entangled connections, they're going to be dynamic, right? Yes. And heavily interactive. But I don't want you to escape my second question because <laughs> I was very clever of you to think you could, but uh, <laughs> when do you think we might actually have a practical quantum internet? Uh, so I would say an early quantum network that others can use that's widely accessible will be available in a year. So that, that's where I'm pretty sure I'll be an outlier. <laughs> okay, well, let me move on to Aiden. Thank you, Duncan. And Aiden, uh, let me ask you uh, the same question, please. All right, so I, I'll try to answer first the question of the, the challenges. I think from my point of view and my experience, there's basically three challenges that we have to overcome. And I think the answers to these questions will come in very soon. The first challenge is more scientific, right? We still need to do a few demonstrations that actually to the proof of principle that, for example, uh, you know, a quantum repeater could work, that quantum memory advantage can be achieved, that we can actually do teleportation over longer distances that just direct propagation goes. So I need to, we need to answer these questions scientifically before we can move further, right? That's one. The second one is, and I'm assuming that we're going to answer the first one, is we need to learn how to connect systems that are distinct in nature. Right? For example, uh, what is being built in, in, in AFRL, what we're building here, what is built in Chicago, what is being built in Boston, how we can guarantee that even though we have uh, heterogeneous systems, we can find homogeneity of operation in between these systems. That's another big challenge that requires thinking about new transduction mechanisms. And I think that's something that we have to answer before we can build that. And then of course the third one, and uh, Maria already talked about this, um, how do we forge our partnerships in a way that the private sector, the national laboratories and the academia, all of us profit from producing new IP. The answer to the second question, I think we probably need to think about this a little bit more in like a phase approach, right? So let's say quantum networks in which we can exchange quantum keys, you know, like Raymond does, perhaps now over long distances assisted by quantum repeaters. My hope is like in five years, we might have something working that actually does that, right? Um, teleportation based experiments in which we can exchange large amounts of classical data using quantum are probably going to be available in 10 years so that they can be operated by many users, right? And maybe, you know, a quantum internet envision as a large distributed network in which quantum computers are connected. For that, quantum computers need to become available. I mean, I don't know if that's going to be the case in the next 10 years. So I'm giving that a 15 year. So then that will be my uh, kind of like my timeline here. And I'm trying to be, you know, uh, humble and realistic to what I've seen that people can do and they can achieve. But you know, that, that will be my, my answer to that. Thanks, David. Thank you. And this is giving us a pretty nice dynamic range of time and space. So this is good, uh, which means, okay, Kathy Ann, so now the burden is on you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think there's a lot of unknowns still left about quantum networking and the quantum internet. And we have a lot of fairly fundamental demonstrations that need to be shown before we can really, you know, get to the quantum internet. 
And, and so from a technical standpoint, I think there's a lot left to do. And I think some of these test beds, like people say, that give access to devices and, and the way to distribute entanglement um, will allow and help with that. But one of the challenges that I think doesn't get talked about as much is how best to collaborate across all these different entities doing quantum networking, industry, academia, and all the labs. Um, and so from, from you asked what can the D, what DOE, what role the DOE will play, excuse me. You know, I think they bring a very complementary set of skills and technology to this problem. And so I think it's great that there's so much going on right now in quantum networking. It's such an exciting time. And I think we're gonna get huge advances in the next few years. Um, so for your last question, I also think we're still a ways off. <laughs> you, use, you, 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 know, you specifically put the word practical in there. And so that's what makes it difficult to answer. I think we'll see very interesting smaller scale things in five years, but probably the practical ones are at least 10 years away would be my guess for the metropolitan thank you. That was, scale. No, that seems, <laughs> thank you. That seems like a, a bold and pretty clear <laughs> prediction. Uh, thanks again. And Maria, same question. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, I, I will agree with everyone and then I will uh, explain a little bit even on the time scale. Right now, if the articulation of the mission of the different stakeholders is um, is put on a table and people agree that there is actually inhomogeneous scopes, right? So um, in the way we did at the DOE, the Exascale project to support the mission of the DOE, or um, it can be used to support national security, we can have different scopes of the different agencies and the industry has a different scope eventually in to create revenues so if we understand how all this works and we use the resources that we have and the ideas that we have i believe that the doe's challenge is to to do the organization to structure it so that everybody can hold hands and find within the different scopes perhaps how they can implement um, the test beds, they give access to various researchers. The challenge, I think, is bringing the scopes, the, the, independent of how different the scopes and the missions are of whoever is involved, to hold hands in order to make it happen. And uh, usually you have to, they have to buy in at the grander level on the ideas behind this. And then on the, when it's going to happen, I think it's going to happen in a staged fashion. So uh, we heard from uh, Brookhaven that uh, there is a uh, quantum information distribution and they will try to do quantum entanglement over hundreds of kilometers. Um, the systems that we have here, we are trying to discuss how to connect with uh, LBL and have intermediate uh, entanglement swapping sites with fiber-based memories to start with. So depending on what you call quantum internet, I think we have test beds of, uh, pro of, uh, of uh, quantum internet prototypes today. And I think within a year, we can have long range to at least start connecting some of the labs that they are not at the level of the repeaters and the more sophisticated ones. But we can also connect with uh, satellites and CubeSats and try and do various demonstrators to understand what can be done. And then for um, the internet, uh, if you want to consider how, the, how many years the internet took to develop from where it started from to the final internet, it took a long time. And so my, uh, my predictions is that at various levels, demonstrations for the quantum internet can start from today and all to, to uh, according to the blueprint, we want to connect all the labs. I think this can happen within, um, depending on the investment also, okay? Because we cannot, we cannot say that we can do these things without investment. So if we assume every resource, every investment and every resource and good collaboration, I think we can do this fast. Within the next seven years, we can connect um, a number of the labs. Um, uh, together. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maria. And so, Raymond, uh, now last but not least, you've had the benefit of hearing everyone's predictions and everybody's concerns. So, you have the rare opportunity to give the last word. Oh, thank you. Um, the analogy of the growth and uh, the birth and growth of the internet is a good one. It's a little bit dangerous uh, because this is a very different system. 
Uh, and it's uh, important that I think we not be beholden to, I mean, some of the growth of the internet was uh, some of the most important steps in the internet were probably accidental. One of the things that I think became crucial for the early growth of the internet, and which I do think is applicable here, is that uh, many of the most important applications were not foreseen by the people who first had the ideas and first started to cobbling together the very first hardware. Um, and uh, I think that that is very likely to be the case here as well. And as we go looking for um, uh, the, well, the funding that's required to do the work that we all really passionately want to do because we're passionate about it, uh, we're also looking for newer, better, more appealing, uh, and more saleable, more tractable uh, applications, places where we can demonstrate uh, and claim quantum supremacy for a network as opposed to merely a computer. Uh, and that is a, a question that I think the community has yet to find to coalesce around a single answer and probably never will. Um, because uh, as Maria correctly points out, different organizations have different interests uh, and it is a heterogeneous group of people, a heterogeneous group of organizations doing this research. Uh, and while we all agree on very, very many things, uh, not all of our bosses do. Um, and and that's, that's the truth of the job. Uh, that said, a place where I think what is needed for the future growth of the quantum networking and the quantum internet was the question posed. Uh, and an answer that I think is valuable and has not yet been contributed uh, is we need more outside thinking. I think we need more people who are not physicists looking at the list of capabilities, looking at the world, looking at markets, looking at, um, and by markets, I don't mean economy, although of course that matters. I mean, uh, places where problems come to be solved, places where problems and solutions come to meet. Uh, and we all try to do that as part of our jobs. Um, and so places where I think, where I see great potential for breakthrough growth are places like, for example, Duncan's collaborations with venture capitalists, about which I don't need to know any details, but uh, speaking uh, with people who look at a problem from a completely different angle, uh, who have the skills and the capabilities to appreciate, to distill the capabilities of a quantum network down to uh, its core value, uh, and to understand uh, how that core value could be applied to systems and problems that you know, we're just not thinking of because it's not in our training. I think that that is yet to come, uh, and I think it will be incredibly valuable, and I think it will frankly be essential uh, for us to be able to um, to really realize the value that we all that we're all dreaming about. Uh, regarding timelines, all I can do is underscore uh, uh, Lydia's comment that it depends entirely on funding. Assuming uh, full funding uh, and our ability to continue uh, generating a or, and, and establish and maintain a uh, a, an adequately large workforce to be able to do the work that we're proposing, um, which I think you know is, is a significant issue we haven't yet addressed, um, and this may not be the forum to do so. Uh, practical quantum computing for which somebody who is not a physicist could walk up, do something, have value uh, come out of it, uh, that probably is a seven-year effort in my estimation. Raymond, thanks very much. And uh, I was averaging the timelines in my head as everybody was speaking. And I actually I do see us coalescing for different reasons, which is uh, both assuring and, and disturbing, actually, at the same time. But I, I want to take the last minute. So thank you very much. This, this is actually great. I'd like to take the last minute uh, to give each of you literally a minute with some concluding remarks. But as moderator, I want to take a prerogative of, of going first, which is probably wrong. But I just have a natural segue to Raymond's comment, which has to do with workforce development, which is something we didn't have time really to touch on here, but I think is something we're all very uh, deeply concerned about because it's the key to building a future technology, the users of the future technology, and to do it in a very inclusive way. And to do it in a style that's very different than, as uh, several of you pointed out, the, the current internet, which often was research, company engagement, product development. You know, here we have an opportunity to rethink the entire picture, doing it all together, right? Trying to capitalize on application, driving the science, driving the marketplace, working in a very different mode. But we also will need to do this by engaging a new force of quantum engineers, you know, a completely new type of workforce without whom it's going to be difficult to see how any of this will happen. So I think that's something that we all have to work on. And as uh, I think some of you said, you don't know where the next great idea is going to come from. It can come from anywhere and from anyone, and sadly, probably not physicists. Uh, 
So we do need to think and work on that as a community. So let me go ahead and just ask each of you for literally a minute to give you any concluding thoughts. Again, Duncan, starting with you. So I'll just pick up on that theme of, uh, of the physicists. And, and uh, again, we're in good company, so I hope no one takes this the wrong way. Um, <laughs> so physicists love to study problems, right? We all like to make sure we get the answer right and the solution right before we roll it out. But I do think, especially with a quantum network, uh, building first and studying later might actually be an advantageous um, approach. You know, building really will will force us all to come together to solve some of these tough problems on how we work together. We'll help seed that workforce development effort. Um, it really will get the engineers involved in the process. And as Ray is saying, we need that, that extra sort of discipline or that new discipline to come in and help move the technology forward. Who knows where it goes, but the more of us that are working on it, the, the better. Uh, Aiden. Yep. Um, I mean, I just as a last remark, I think something that was not discussed in, 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 this, in this panel was basically, how do you make a quantum network the quantum internet? And I think in order to answer that question, we need to talk to a lot of communication and networking engineers that already developed one version of the internet. And we need to find out how is that a quantum network, maybe entanglement based, cryptographic, et cetera, can be controlled using the classical internet, because I think those are problems in which controlling optically with classical means a quantum network might be where we actually find the bottlenecks that need to be solved. And many of these problems and many of these questions have not been asked. So I think now is the right time to start asking them. And this is why we should all come together to try to do this, right? Because it's very different to have a quantum network than having a quantum internet. Thank you, Aiden and Kathy Ann. Yeah, thank you. I, I'll echo the comments uh, that workforce is critically important to this, having a multidisciplinary workforce to actually do the work on these test beds and in the labs is, you know, we're not going to get there without that. But also, I think it's a really exciting time and it's a fun time to be in quantum networking. So I'm looking forward to what the next few years holds. Me too. Maria. I would like to figure out not just the killer app for the quantum computer or the quantum network, but I would like to figure out how can I take the maximum, um, the maximum superposition of states that come out of a measurement that it is a quantum measurement and figure out with some quantum interconnect and quantum processor how to get results that I would never, ever, ever, ever get any other way. And uh, I think these are the kind of discussions that we have uh, uh, with, uh, with a bunch of colleagues uh, in order to, in including uh, Hartmut from Google and other people that uh, we want to figure out um, fundamentally what does it mean to have access in the interconnects, on the edges, and on the sensing to taking a direct measurement and analyzing in that way. And being at Caltech, of course, I have in my mind a lot of the LIGO results with a squeezed line and the superposition of states. So this fundamental um, uh, aspect of it is really, truly intriguing. And then the systems, these kind of systems can, can, bear, uh, can bear it to, to the reality. Thank you all for doing this. I really appreciate it. And so Raymond, final thoughts. Thank you. Very briefly, I would just uh, conclude by observing that the defining feature of this age uh, is that it is the information age, that for the first time in human history, we all have the ability to essentially access virtually any piece of information anytime from anywhere. And I think that that will only become that, you know, the, 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 the relative value of information and its widespread accessibility will only increase going forward. And I would say that it's worth noting that uh, the fundamental limits on information and its spread are all quantum, right? We know that the fundamental bounds for all of these questions are the quantum bounds, not the classical ones. And as we do this research, uh, we are motivated to do so by the knowledge that we are really pushing forward. We are finding the edge of the envelope and exactly what are uh, the abilities, the skills, uh, what is required to be able to uh, push forward really the uh, the state of the age. And so I think, uh, you know, I find this really the, uh, the most compelling uh, field uh, to be researching uh, right now, because I feel like it is uh, the one that really is trying to find uh, where's the edge of the map. I think this is where the frontiers are right now. And I think, and I take great joy in pushing them back. Thank you. Mm -hmm.